initiative on digital editions by uh, now I'm struggling again with your name, Barbara, Barbara Borda Lejo. Um, we just had a discussion on that. <laughs> Um, so she is a, a textual critic, uh, editor, and digital humanist uh, with a background in English literature. Uh, she directs um, the Country Tales um, project, which has pioneered research methodologies in the humanities, including the use of evolutionary biology software for the use of text, for the study of text. I'm actually quite interested in that part. Uh, she's worked at four different universities on two continents, edited Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Darwin's Origin of Species, and collaborated in the creation of edition of Dante's Commedia, um, Boccaccio's Teseda, and the 15th century Castilian Cancioris. That's, uh, I'm, I'm glad that, that I don't have to pronounce these names all the time. Um, she worked with uh, Angus Ward of the University of Birmingham in an electronic edition and research environment on the uh, Astoria de España and with Peter Robinson, University of uh, Saskatchewan, on the uh, Textual Communities Project, a tool for transcribing, uh, collating and publishing text. Um, Barbara, uh, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to uh, pronounce all these difficult names anymore. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, that, of course, will make you stop sharing your screen. Uh, OK, it goes like that. And uh, uh, here we are, I think. Oh, why are you doing this? OK. Let's see. Oh, that's working. So thank you so much for that, and thank you for inviting me uh, here today. I'm, I'm very happy that I get to talk about digital editions. I, I know some people in this group, uh, but from a different context, I do I do other things before, besides editing, but uh, um, this is my main work. This is how I came into the digital humanities many years ago, and uh, and how I became interested in using computers for studying texts. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit of, of the background on that. I was a student uh, many years ago. I will not, I don't want to say how, how long ago, though, that makes me kind of ancient uh, at NYU. And I was taking a class with Thomas Tansell uh, at the time. And uh, he, I had discovered already a country retails project. I, I had run into it as a part of another class and uh, I had, met Peter Robinson virtually at the time. And um, then uh, uh, Thomas Tansel invited Terry Catarpano to come and give a talk for the class. And he had been a former student and studied at Princeton at the Summer Institute. And uh, Terry Catarpano, uh, who works now, I think, at the New York Public Library, he came and he showed the Canterbury Tales Project uh, edition of the Wife of Bath prologue. And uh, it was very impressive at the time. Uh, I will show you a little bit of how those editions look like in a moment, but uh, for me, it was it was incredible. It had images. They were uh, photocopied, uh, scans of photocopies of uh, of microfilms. So today we'll we'll look at them and say, "Wow, that's absolutely terrible." But at the time, it was wonderful. You had all these manuscripts that you could see. Uh, as part of the CD-ROM, it was an incredible thing. And he had the transcriptions and the collations and everything. And it was it was a very impressive uh, undertaking. But of course, the Gandhi Tells project had a lot of people and funding behind, and I was very aware of that. But then Terry showed an edition that he had made by himself of, a, of an American text. And it was amazing. And I thought, oh, I want to do that. And uh, I remember going back to my supervisor at the time, uh, David Hoover, and I said, oh, you know what I did today? I just uh, got the TI guidelines out of the library and I'm going to teach myself SGML. <laughs> and he made fun of me and said, oh, you're digging your own grave. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting. So I'll show you a little bit of how those editions look like. This is, you cannot, uh, probably uh, see them anymore. This is the Tenor Prologue. This was published in 2000 and it says there. And if you notice, even the image that I have is, is pretty bad. It has that, that square that appears there and it doesn't go away. This was published 
using something called Dynatext. And it was published by Cambridge University Press. At the time, CUP thought that this was going to be a big thing, uh, maybe even a good business. <laughs> and uh, they, they had a contract with the Canterbury Tales project. And they were going to publish uh, many different uh, editions. Uh, Dynatex died many years ago. Uh, I have one computer still that runs this uh, software and I can sometimes use it, but it is very doubtful. It's quite, quite bad. But you can, you can see the index there of the things that were available. It was very impressive at the time. I, I have to say, I was so, I, I, I thought I was very lucky that it could be part of this, this project. Um, this is, uh, for example, a uh, regular escalation, and I'll show you this because I will be showing the same variants uh, during the talk, so you can see them. So this is the regular escalation, but very first word of the calendar details, that is one, and uh, uh, it says, well, it's out in 19 witnesses, that is 19 of, of the, the manuscripts and printed editions do not have it, and uh, it is just us in the lemma in 34 witnesses. So there is no variation there. And that's how we show, or how we used to show the collation in these very early editions. Now, if you think about 2000, that's 21 years ago, is a whole, in, in, in many places, is a whole uh, drinking age person. <laughs> uh, that's how long ago this was made. Anyway, so uh, the following year in 2001, we published uh, our first full color uh, facsimile of the Hengert manuscript. And the Hengert Chaucer is one of the most important manuscripts of the Canterbury Tales. Probably some people would say it's the most important one. This is an image of our edition, our edition of, of this, this uh, manuscript. At the time we, uh, we financed the digitization of it, uh, we paid about 10,000 British pounds for the manuscript to be digitized. And it was it was fantastic. Again, there were such high resolution, these images. Uh, for the first time, you could really access this, this, uh, this manuscript from anywhere in the world. It was it was a very expensive production for us, but uh, but we had funding from, from the government and uh, we, we could afford doing that at the time. It's not a good economic model, but <laughs> But it worked, and uh, well, we 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 did many things with it. So, uh, for example, you can uh, look in the manuscript not just the openings as as we have here, but you can look at the conjugates of the pages. So you can virtually take the manuscript apart, put it back together, and then you look at at the two pieces of the same vellum, and you can flip them. So you can do a lot of things with it. Uh, it's Great fun if you're studying manuscripts, and I, I am very, I'm, I'm very interested in, in, in manuscript studies, but I'm really a textual critic, so I'm more interested in the text than in the object. Uh, although these are very, very cool objects, of course. So this is uh, a little bit of how we present it. So it looks very much like it would uh, in a in a codex, in a in a printed codex. So we have images, we have trans uh, transcriptions. We try to be quite uh, detailed with the transcriptions. And um, so, yeah, that's more or less how it looks like. We are, we are reissuing this uh, soon. And uh, then we also, we also besides, besides doing this single uh, witness editions, we have multi-text editions that are the ones that interest me the most. Uh, and before I get into that, I'm going to introduce you to this uh, demon. This is the demon patron of scribes and he may, his name is Titivulus. And Titivulus's job was to go to the world picking all the errors that scribes would make and he would put them in a bag and then those, those, all those mistakes will be weighted against the scribe and then they will decide whether that was a good scribe or not a good scribe. So I, I love talking about that. It's my favorite demon of all demons. And uh, it's very, very relevant to the kind of work we do because without, without variation, we wouldn't be able to, to do our work. And uh, as you'll see now, a lot of, of what we do is about that textual variation. So this is a newer edition, still 15 years old now, better images, 
even uh, you can see the gold leaf in that in that A is a very beautiful digitization. Yeah, I think uh, all the details that you can see, you, I, I can, could have made it even bigger than that. And what we do is we, of course, have notes to explain what this is. And this particular edition, the editor was very, very interested in, in talking about the colors of the different letters and the emphatic things. So you'll see that things that we haven't uh, done in others. So my, my gain interest in this was in encoding. So these are the reasons why you encode text. So we try to make text readable. Uh, we might regularize the handwriting. So I can read uh, medieval hands, but for example, it's difficult for me uh, to read secretary hands, later, later uh, hands than that. Uh, we might standardize the spelling or punctuation. We make the text, text searchable, which is very important. So the manuscripts are not searchable uh, in this way, but, but once I, I have transcribed it, I can look for any word or groups of words or names or things, and then I can locate them in the, in the manuscript. We want also to make them exchangeable, we want to be able to share the text with other people, to put them in different systems, to do different types of analysis. We want to compare text with each other, of course. And we want to present different texts within a single document. And by that, I mean, um, I have written a lot about the theory of, of the, our interpretation of manuscripts uh, and how the corrections are read by us. So we have one manuscript that is in the document itself, uh, one, one text that is in the document itself, and we have the text that we built in our understanding of what that means. So for example, someone um, maybe crosses out a word, so I know that they meant for that word to be not taken into account, or they put something between the lines and they add a carrot, or they want this word to be included. So all of that is interpretive acts and uh, create different layers of text in a single document. And of course, we want to produce additions. So we use now extensible markout language, so XML, not SGML. So David Hoover was right. <laughs> SGML lasted for like a couple of years after I started to learn it. And uh, the reason why we use uh, XML is because it's much easier than SGML actually. And we want that because it separates the content from the form, eh, which HTML doesn't do. We like it because it's extensible. It allows us to create new and different types of encoding. I will show you some of the ones that I have uh, made up. We can check it uh, very easily. And then, of course, we have the two qualities. It has to be well-formed and it has to be valid. And well-formed and valid are things that we often talk about in the TI. Uh, so it's valid if it um, responds to your um, to your DTD, to your document def definition, all the parameters that you have put there. And it's well formed when there are no errors in the encoding. Um, this is uh, how our newest edition looks like. It's an edition for mobile devices. I will show it to you at the end and I will tell you where to get it. Uh, but it's also the first page of the Hinger man manuscript. So it has that word Juan, and then that Avril, what he should have thought, et etc. I'm showing you this so you can see what we are dealing with. So in this manuscript, what do we have? We have um, one corner that has been eaten by rats, and you can see the little teeth mark there if you look hard enough. Uh, rats really were very fond of this manuscript and ate big chunks of it. Uh, we have a big stain there that goes through several of the of the first folios. We have some illumination, uh, French style, with a little bit of gold leaf left. Uh, you don't know this uh, from seeing this image, but when you compare with the following and with its conjugate, uh, what you realize is it has to have been exposed this this uh, front page to the elements for a very long time because it's a very different color from the rest of the manuscript. Um, so all of those things are things worth looking at. There's also a, some notes at the top. You can see book and you can see C-H-A-U. So someone started to write Chaucer. Uh, various things that you can, you can see in this page. 
So this is how we encode it. And uh, uh, I don't know how familiar uh, you might be with the, with the TI, maybe you are very familiar. So this is no, not news to you, uh, or I don't know, maybe you have never seen uh, this before. <laughs> Uh, so what we do is we have is a, is a TI compliant uh, text, and this is the, the main body of it. We put details about uh, the folio, and for us, very important, to the group that this belongs to. So for us, is the division says it's the general prologue, and uh, and that that is very important for us because we want to be able to uh, collate this text. We have an initial rubric in English. Here we begin at the book of the Tales of Canterbury, and you'll see that there are abbreviation marks and expansions, and that is uh, for the different types of uh, text display that we want to have. Some special characters you'll see there too. Anyway, this gives you an idea of what goes on into the, into the transcription that allows us to produce uh, our editions. So we transcribe characters. Uh, we have made decisions specifically about which char characters we want to transcribe and in which way. So, uh, for example, in this case, is uh, there are two meanings at the end of the word Alison. Alison. So it's A L I S O, meaning meaning, and a macron on top. So for the project for policies, we uh, transcribe that as a U macron. Or sometimes we say, well, that's double meaning that is resolved as a U, but it has a macron, which is an abbreviation for an N. So all of that information we put in, in each of our uh, transcriptions. And we put that by hand and it's, uh, it's a lot of work. So for example, here is a different one that is Anun. And Anun, uh, you know, has a little bit of a tail there, a flourish at the end of the, the two meanings, but we decide this, we resolve as an N rather than an U. So this is this is a, the kind of, uh, of thing that we need to be looking at that is different for, for a, every one of the lines from every one of the scribes, for every one of the manuscripts and the early printed edition. So we have uh, come up with a series of transcription guidelines for these manuscripts. And uh, well, this is part of that system. Let me see, this is not moving. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about semantics. Uh, and semantics is um, a method uh, of uh, approaching to approach text, to study text, that is attributed to Karl Lachmann. And um, he never really wrote about it uh, in the way that we conceive it or theorize about it, but he did practice it. That is, he compared different uh, texts and tried to uh, tell how they related to each other. Before him, other people had suggested this, this idea, they had talked about it, uh, but um, he actually was the first one to, to, to do a separation between a, the, the, the preparation, the stages of preparation of critical editions. So he decided that it was important first to establish how the variants, how the texts related to each other, and then if necessary, to change those texts and, and, and present them in a, in a manner that was more suitable for the readers, when, uh, more appropriate to different types of readings. Um, so there is a parallelism between uh, semantics and evolutionary theory. They kind of develop simultaneously, independently, but simultaneously, but clearly it's, it happened in a world where people were very interested in classification, where they wanted uh, to understand things in a way that hadn't happened before. And they wanted to explore relationships between a uh, different, different uh, let's say elements of whatever they were studying. Uh, this is a famous, a very famous um, diagram uh, that uh, is found among uh, the papers of uh, Charles Darwin and uh, he says famously, I think, and he draws this thing that uh, people take it to the uh, very first uh, evolutionary tree. Uh, 
And uh, I even once met someone that has this tattooed on his body, uh, on his arm, <laughs> which is very, very peculiar. And this is uh, the very first uh, Stemma Codicum that we know of uh, that was printed as such. And what it does is it represents textual relationships, right? So this is how we do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I, I didn't include all the details about this. I have an article that is about to come, to come out where I, for the first time, explain the whole process of producing this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, evolutionary uh, estematic tree. I, I, I call it a stemma. Some of my colleagues insist that it isn't because it doesn't have a root, but uh, I don't think it needs a root to be a stemma. Uh, and what we do is we produce using our collation software, a table of comparisons, and we put it in such a um, uh, format that is an X file that we can feed it into evolutionary biology software. This, uh, this stem actually was produced using a piece of software that is called PAUP, phylogenetic analysis using parsimony and other methods. And, um, what it shows here is quite amazing. If you look at the where the arrow is, that's HG is Hengard, is the manuscript that I have been talking about. And Christchurch and Elsmere are very close to it. And that to us is very important. We have known for a very long time that Elsmere and Hengard are, are close together. They were written by the same scribe and produced maybe 20 years apart. But Christchurch has not been studied very much. It's a much later manuscript, probably 60 years, produced 60 years after the death of Chaucer. We knew from our collation that it was very close to Henker and Elsmer. We just didn't realize how close. And this is how close it is textually. It's like they all come from the same source. And we can show that by, by looking at the details of the collation, but for us, uh, it was, it was a great discovery when, when we saw this and when we have seen this very, very consistently in, uh, in different parts of the tale. So this is the, it's a stemma for the Miller's tale only, right? Uh, and we have the different groups. I have put a key there if you're interested, but what is important about, about it is that those groups were established by scholars manually, A, B, C, and D, uh, many years ago. And there is no reason to, to to doubt that they are correct. And actually this software places it quite correctly. The, the B group really very nicely in blue, the A group in red, a close together. There are not surprises for us in that. The surprises are in other parts, as I said, where those manuscripts really are close together, Christchurch particularly to Hinger and Elsmere. Uh, I show you a different one. You can see again the A and B groups really, really nice in, in this section. This is the non spritz tail. And again, Hengen and Elsmere down there uh, quite uh, next to each other. Uh, very, very close. So we're very pleased with the results of the phylogenetic uh, analysis. It, it works very well. We have tried it with different textual traditions. We tried it with the, the Comedia. Uh, with the monarchia, um, and also uh, people studying the Greek New Testament at the University of Munster and at the University of Birmingham have been using it. And for that very large textual tradition, it has been quite successful. So we are always surprised when, when people don't take us very seriously because I don't know. So I'll show you what is behind that analysis. So let's take one line. This is a, a line of the of the non spree steel besides a grobe stand in nadale that's the corpus manuscript that is in oxford and so this is the the word that i will be looking at standing uh, and i want to show you what is in the other manuscripts so this is uh, our edition so we have some some three manuscripts uh, saying dwelling and the rest are saying standing. This is a regular escalation. That means that the spellings are not identical, but we have done it like this so we can focus on what we call a thematically significant variation. And um, this is how it looks like when we put it uh, into a Nexus file. That is what I used to build uh, those, uh, those uh, stemata. So the Nexus file will 
say in this particular line, line three of the nonce free steel, we have at this place of variation, two variants, standing and dwelling. And then later on, it will look at the variance and it will say, okay, so where it says zero, right? It's, it's in agreement with stunding. So the fir first witness would be probably 81. The second witness might be 82. I don't remember now each of these points, but the software knows that because I have given the instructions. When you see a question mark, uh, what you have is uh, no, no text in that particular section. And one is the very first variant. So in this case, there's only two variants, so it would be dwelling, right? So this is how it is encoded uh, before it goes into the, the um, phylogenetic software. So I want to show you a little bit of uh, Codex Sinaiticus that it was a single manuscript edition we published with the British Library and it was groundbreaking for other reasons, but uh, I think it's very cool and I always like to talk about it. Uh, we had really very good images of this, of this manuscript uh, and they are very readable. But um, the manuscript is in different, in different libraries. Uh, most of it is in the British Library, but there is a part of it in St. Petersburg, another part in St. Catherine's Monastery where, where it was found uh, recently just uh, in, a, in a binding, in an old binding. So people, uh, scholars had not seen this manuscript as a whole a object for a hundred and something years. And uh, what the Codex Sinaiticus project did is it put it all together. And it's the, on, the oldest uh, a complete a manuscript of the Bible. So it has the Old and the New Testament. A, although most of our colleagues focus on the on New Testament studies. And uh, it virtually allows people to see this for the first time. Uh, it was an amazing project because when we launched, actually we broke the, <laughs> the British Library site because uh, something like a million people accessed it on the first week. And let's be very clear that this is not a popular project. This is a scholarly project. What are people doing looking at this manuscript in Greek written in a scriptura continua? It's really, but people were, people wanted to see it. They were eager to, to take a look. And uh, it was very, you know, for us uh, revealing to, to realize how many uh, citizens, not university professors, were looking at this thing. It was amazing. So I also learned quite a bit about that when I did the online variorum of the Origin of the Species. And this was uh, originally published in 2009 uh, for the to coincide with the 150th anniversary of the text. And um, then reissued in, in 2012. So it needs, as you can see, I'm, I'm going, uh, I'm getting, getting towards the present. Uh, and I'm sorry that I only use, or that I'm mostly using our editions for this, but uh, I feel that, that we have a, a clear uh, pattern of, uh, of how things have been developing. Um, what I like about this edition is the concises of it, how we managed to put within a single page so much information. So one of the things that you see is again, same is the same procedure, right? Transcription and the image. Uh, in this case, you don't need to make the, the text more readable, but the, the synthetic view allows you to know that there is a variant introduced a, in the very title in 1872, but one in 1866. So you see the color coding, was, let you see that instantly. And I think that that's very cool. Um, so this is my, my favorite uh, variant in the origin of a species. So it's a good thing that you haven't heard me say any of this before because <laughs> otherwise you'd be bored with it. But uh, here, is, here, here it is, I, I love it. So. This is the historical sketch, something that he wrote for the first time in 1861. And he wrote, the great majority of naturalists believe that species are immutable create productions and have been separately created. And in 69, he changed that to 
until recently, the great majority of naturalists believed that species were immutable productions and had been separately created. And I love that because uh, to me, it's like the moment when the world changed, but also I, I can imagine being Darwin and, and, and waking up one day and saying, oh gosh, everybody seemed to think this way before, but then I published my book and look, now they have changed their mind. So let me change this until recently. I, I think it's such a, a momentous uh, thing. I, I really love it. My favorite variant, the origin of a species. And uh, well, I'm coming to the Cantab general prologue. That is our latest, not our latest now, but our last uh, publication from last year. Uh, and uh, what you 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 can go and see it if you want. Uh, it's in in uh, this particular address. But the idea is really that you use your mobile phone and you go to Google Play or to the Apple Store and you search Canterbury Tales Dinner Prologue and you download it for free. And what is interesting? Oh, I didn't say this about the the uh, the Darwin edition, but it it always struck me the that edition as uh, one that had beaten many records. Uh, I get about 12,000 visitors a year for the online Vario room. Uh, that is more than any other edition that I know of with the exception of the Nestle Allen Great New Testament in printed form that is distributed in all seminaries all over the world. So this brings me then to the Kentab that within the first three months had something like 60,000 downloads. So suddenly everybody was looking at the Cantor Tales. And of course we had uh, some press and, uh, and uh, well, people are cu curious, so they go and then download the app. So what it does is it centers on the images, but it has an edited text that is the first time that we ever publish it, an edited text. We normally publish transcriptions and it has translation. Besides that, there is also a performance of the general prologue by uh, an actor called Lena Gibbons and also a reading of the text. What it does is it helps you to understand, it helps you to uh, read the text when you don't have a professor with you, when you don't have anyone telling you, oh, this is what this means. So they, we have glosses, we have notes. It's a really a, a, a reader's edition, I call it, you know, it's for beginners, but it also allows you to explore the text by yourself if you want to. And also, of course, if I'm teaching the country tells and my students say, oh, I forgot the book. I said, no, 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 download it. And then, then you can have excuses, <laughs> which is a very good thing when you're teaching. Uh, so I, I should show you the live demo. I'm afraid of that, but I'll do it anyway. Because, um, you know, sometimes when you try to do these things live, it doesn't work. Air beginneth the book of the Talus of Canterbury. One that Avon, the sure sota, the drocht of March at Perse to the rota, and bathed every vine in speech liquor, of which fair to engender it is the flour. One Zephyrus egg with his sway to breath, in spirit hath and every halt and haith the tender crops, and the young sun. So I can swap the to the translation. If I want and smaller foolish back in melody that sleep in all the nick with open or if you want, you can go to my words. editor text. Van long and folk to go on pilgrimages and palmers for the second. So that's the notes uh, which you have for historical notes for the text, and he has and glosses. Especially from every sheer ascender of Engelon to Canterbury, they went. Anyway, so that's how it looks like, and uh, you can you can play with it and explore it a little bit more if if you so wish. Uh, but it is it is a really uh, oh I have slides for it in case it didn't work. Uh, but it's a really uh, neat addition, I think, and it works very well. I'm going to give you also uh, since my computer is working well and there are no problems, I will sh show you a preview of our next edition that is. Uh, a scholarly edition of the um, 
the tales of the rib and the cook, and that you can find at inklesedition.com. Uh, for now, it's freely available. We will eventually uh, charge for part of the edition, not for all of it, or Inklis will charge, not me. Uh, so this is this is how it looks like now. It's a little bit more, more modern looking, but again, same principle, right? Uh, you can have any of the witnesses here, the different uh, printed editions, if you want to go and see them. And uh, they is loading in real time. So it's not that, uh, that uh, this is all being converted in real time. It's, um, it's not in HTML, that's what I want to say. Uh, you can uh, look at the different witnesses. So we have all the, all the different manuscripts and printed editions, and it just swaps from one to the other very, very quickly. You can uh, see just the images, the text, or you can look at the collation. And that's the, the map. We have made it a little bit interactive now. So when you move from one variant to the other, you see the changes in color that indicate where that variant is present in the stemma. And uh, yeah, you can just roll about and see it. One of the things that you can do, I want a different line. Let me see if I can uh, change that to this. So I want to show you this one, this, this variant, that is Cantabrige, Cambridge. Uh, it's not yet complete decollation, but, but it's, it's pretty good. And uh, the reason why I want to show you that is because um, we have a, like uh, quite a bit of division in the, in the project. So I think that there are two variants, Cambridge and Canterbridge, uh, and that those two should be kept separately for metrical reasons, uh, not a, or a historical um, motives, but, uh, but it's a very, very interesting thing. What you can do is you can see the original spellings for each of those variants. So let's say Trumpington, <laughs> this is how the original spellings are distributed. For us, that's not that interesting. Uh, we are not uh, uh, historical linguists, so we hide that and we present like this. And this is the variation that for us matters from uh, a systematic point of view. Um, so that's that's our latest edition, I guess, <laughs> for you to, to see. And uh, let me see. Oh, yeah, I was going to talk a little bit about the variance uh, in the in the how we present the variance in the CANTAP. A, uh, one of the principles for it is to and make the text as accessible as possible. So one of the most famous variants here, Averil, instead of April. Uh, Averil is the reading hanger that is our, our base text generally. And I have changed it to April just because I think for the purposes of a reader's edition, it would be so much easier for someone that arrives for the first time to the text and finds that the third world word is familiar to them rather than a weird, strange spelling of something that should be familiar. So I, I that's the principle, I think, behind the reader's edition. I just want to say something about that. Um, so that's one of my final slides. It's just kind of a jokey thing, but yes, digital editions, just like waking up in the library after closing time. I, I like to think about them like that, particularly now during the pandemic, we cannot go anywhere, <laughs> but we can still access anything that is online and that is uh, openly available. And I am uh, very much for open access and for availability and for sharing these materials with as many people as possible. So, you know, we all can benefit from it. And thank you very much. I think that that's more or less what I want to say today. Uh, please ask me any questions or, you know, make any comments. Uh, I don't know, it was very nice to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really, really enjoyed this uh, presentation. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. Perhaps people do have questions. So if you do, please uh, paste them in the chat and then we'll, we'll go through them. Um, while, while people are busy writing questions in the chat, I actually have a few questions. So I was actually wondering, you almost answered some of them um, 
just at the end. So I'll start with another one. So I'm actually quite curious how you collect all this information. So there's the examples you showed, there's so much information kind of encoded in, in the back that you don't see and you can only kind of see through that using the interface. But where does all this information come from? How many people have been working on this? <laughs> that is a really good question, actually. Uh, if I counted from the very beginning of the Cantor Tops project, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 people have worked on it, maybe more. Uh, it also depends who you count as working on it. We now have a very, very good system. We work with a, with a system called Textual Communities that is also freely available. The address is textualcommunities.org and it's a system for transcribing and editing text. And uh, that keeps track of exactly who changes every comma. So we can give credit to absolutely everybody. So when you look at the, I used to do that in my, the, in my presentation, when you look at the intro page for any of our editions, there is a very long list of people who have participated. Uh, the transcriptions are done by hand. <laughs> so we have to put uh, every line of code there. I am a bit of a nerd, so I don't dislike it. Uh, <laughs> I kind of enjoy it. I find it very zen to encode things. And, um, uh, one of the things that I did is I have invented a very uh, complex, actually, uh, system to, within a single transcription, have the variant states of the text. So I could, I didn't show that, but I can collate different textual stages in a single manuscript. For example, the Sinaiticus uh, manuscript has 14 correctors. That means that there are at least 14 layers of text, people who understood the text differently or change it for some reason. And we want to consider those separately. So in our collation, we have for example, the original state of a manuscript, and then they, depending on how many stages, could be the very last state or intermediate states, and they are collated against each other and against the other witnesses. So that's uh, another thing that we do, even though I didn't talk about it very much. Uh, but yeah, there are a lot of people are involved. So right now... So wonderful. So, so, so it, it, is, is that mostly people that you know, or is it also kind of crowdsourcing we haven't done crowdsourcing. We have thought about it. The Historia de España does crowdsourcing. So they have videos and things uh, very much following the transcribed Bentham principles. Uh, for us, it's, it's complicated because uh, it's not easy to read medieval hands. Uh, I can tell you that the people that are working with me now uh, are I have three students that are medievalists and that are interested in, in, in Middle English. And currently I have three students who came from very different areas. One of them is interested, for example, in digital literature, but he wanted to learn. So I said, fine, I'll, I'll teach you. And uh, we, we have sat together and we are uh, teaching him paleography and, and Middle English language and things like that. And he's been very, very good. Uh, he's from India. So we met there a couple of years ago. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's about it's about who's interested, really. Uh, so if people are interested, they are very welcome to to come to the project. And I didn't say this, but we just got. I'm so happy about this. Uh, it's kind of a secret still, but we just got funding for the next five years. Uh, so we are going to be recruiting students, masters and PhD students, in the next few months uh, to work with us uh, as part of the project. And cool. uh, well, we are thrilled about that, but yeah, that is, is a large Congratulations. Project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, I, I don't see any, any questions in the chat. Um, oh, no, people are really welcome to, to ask questions in the chat, um, but I can continue as well. Sure. There are no questions. I, have, I, I think really also, one more. we have not so many people could turn the video on and, and ask a question if they wanted to. Yeah, if that uh, lowers the, the, the threshold, the, the bandwidth, band then, then that's fine <laughs> with me as well. <laughs> okay. So, so one other thing that I was actually wondering, so when you, when you showed this uh, comparison between the different manuscripts, at first I was wondering, how do you compare these, uh, these manuscripts? Mm -hmm. But you gave some examples there. So it's mostly on a lexical uh, item uh, basis. And I was actually really wondering, wouldn't it make more sense to 
do that on a on, on essentially on a letter by letter basis. Uh, well, so you get more variation. Sure. But what exactly us, are you then measuring? Mm -hmm. For us, we we how we do it is we have integrated a collation tool into textual communities. Uh, initially, many years ago, we used to use Collate. That was a piece of software that Peter had developed, Peter Robinson. And Collate was for many years the, the standard, the gold standard for collation. Uh, but then eventually when the Macintosh changed to Intel processors, we couldn't run it anymore. And uh, we collaborated with uh, a group uh, that started as part of Intradition uh, in the Huygens Institute actually in Holland. So we work with um, Joris van Sundert and other people there. And they uh, made a new collate or, or a new collate program. I shouldn't say a new collate. It's a new collation program. It's called Collatex. And we, we have integrated it in the system. So if let's say that you wanted to do this work. You go textual communities and you can transcribe, you can collate there, and you can use the API to publish. So, and it's free. But so that's practically how we do it. Uh, there is a database where all the information goes. We, after transcribing, uh, we go through a process of regularization. For us, it doesn't make sense to compare letter by letter. We get just too much variation that is not systematically significant. So it's linguistically significant and dialectologically significant, but it's, for us, it's not helpful. So it confuses the software and it doesn't produce any, any results that are particularly illuminating. But uh, we have had a uh, dialectologist and linguists work with the, with the data and they do different things. They, they do different work. And, and definitely we have our transcriptions are for that, for other people to use in any way they see fit. So, yeah. but we don't. Yeah, so, so you would get something like differences between scribes. You if, could. If you do that. Yes, you could do that. You could find a, dialect, a dialectological differences. You could find differences in, uh, for example, learning of how to to be a scribe because different schools of scribes are, um, approach the work very differently. So some of them are taught to transcribe exactly what they see as much as they can, while others are more interpretive. You know, a little bit the same, I think, happens with translation that people do either idea by idea or word by word. So it's kind of like that. But yeah, so you, you can find different, different things there. Uh, there is a, a wealth of information. And that's why for us, it's very important that all of our materials become freely available to everyone. So others can do yeah. different types of research. Yeah, yeah. And it, it looks like wonderful uh, resources. I mean, you, you can see the amount of work that's gone into it. It's it's amazing. Just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. One day, my mother was visiting me from Argentina, and was just uh, uh, during the the months before we released the the app. And uh, I was double checking some things in in one of the old editions in the general blog, the one that is all broken, and. Uh, and she said, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing this work and, you know, doing this. That's what you do? <laughs> she said, she thought it was like a horrible thing, you know, my goodness. And people are interested in that. I said, well, not that much, I guess, but but I still do it. No, I, it's, uh, I love that work. It's, yeah, it's, no, I can imagine it. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I really love this kind of work, especially the... So in, in a way, I'm, I'm lazy. I want the computer to do everything for me. But in a way, you do need to do the manual work before you can actually do the uh, analysis. So it's wonderful to see this. Well, and even when, when the computer can do things for you, I remember that people used to say to me, ah, yeah, because the computer does the collation for you. And I, I normally would say in an article very formally, I said it's, it's computer-assisted collation. It's not computer collation. Yeah. The computer doesn't do it. You have to align it by hand. You have to tell it. So I sit there and I said, this word is spelled like this. It's actually the same as this other word that is spelled differently. So I have to do that for every single variant, for every single line of the Canterbury Tales. And then I align it and I said, compare this chunk, these three words with these three words, or this phrase with this phrase, or this single word with this single word. 
because otherwise the alignment doesn't is not as readable for for people when it comes out as an apparatus. So it's uh, there is a lot of of uh, minute work involved in it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for for showing this. Um, I'm I'm actually going to try the app as well. Okay. Um, I'm try the app. Curious about try that. <laughs> the textual communities, if you would like. We can also do with textual communities. It's really optimized for for uh, working with multiple uh, witnesses of a single text. But you can, for example, let's say that you wanted to do a transcription of a, one document that, that is important. You could do that too. And um, hmm. yeah, it's um, it has lots of advantages. I didn't show it today. Uh, I think next month uh, I'm scheduled to 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 give a workshop of textual communities in Nigeria, actually. Like, a little bit like this, no? <laughs> in Nigeria, yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very sorry. I was saying, I was saying to my daughter, I said, "Oh, you know, I have this presentation in South Africa, but I just don't get to go to South Africa." I was a bit that's, sad about that. <laughs> so anyway, mm, uh, that's unfortunate. Who knows? In the future, we can the future, arrange yeah. something like that. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, I, would, I would like to. So that I would love to try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're also getting close to the uh, to the five o'clock, at least in in South Africa uh, time. So again, thank you very much for the presentation. I I seriously enjoyed it. Um, but I think we'll 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 um, we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. And um, my email was there, so people can always reach out to me. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.